Welcome back, everybody, to another networking video. We have been working through Chapter 10 in the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols from O'Reilly. And I included a couple of extra components of, for the chapter. One was DHCP, so there was a video on that. And this time we're working through DNS, or the Domain Name System, which is also in that Chapter 10 on the User Datagram Protocol. Now before we dive in, let's remind ourselves about a couple of basic networking ideas. So here we see a small network. It's a 192.168.1.0 network. And what I like to say is that there are four numbers that we usually use on a network to communicate. And that is to say, if I want to get to all the services and maybe get out to that fantastic internet party. And those numbers would be my IP address, and my mask, because the mask helps me understand what network I'm on, and then a gateway to get me off of my network to the internet party, and then of course DNS, which is what we're going to talk about today. DNS is the domain name system, and sometimes we talk about my DNS server, and we'll describe exactly what those are here in just a bit. The domain name system is critical for us because it provides a resolution between IP addresses that computers use and the names that humans use. RFCs 1034 and 1035 describe the domain name system and how it's all put together, but there have been lots and lots of updates to DNS over the years. In fact, it's got a long list. It's one of the most updated services that we have out there. DNS uses UDP port 53, to communicate and that's true whether you're the client or the server or what we might call the server and the resolver which is on the client side and what we use to ask the question. So here's our basic problem. Humans can't remember IP addresses. We can remember a couple if we've been doing it a while but for the most part we like human readable names. So that's why all your favorite websites are all, you know, someserver.com or someserver.net. So if you want to go out and look up something on Wikipedia, you go to www.wikipedia.org because you can remember that name. What you can't remember is the IP address that's associated with Wikipedia. Now, historically, we used to stick all of these mappings in a file on our machines called hosts.txt. So you would go to look up one of these destinations and your computer would do a lookup right in this file and you would see just line after line after line of the IP address that would go along with the destination you were looking for. But that's hard to manage as you can probably imagine. Lots and lots of errors with updates and things like that. And how do you get this distributed, etc., etc. So there has to be a better way. And this, of course, brings us to the domain name system. Now, when we consider all of the networks that are connected together into other networks, until finally we have this big giant thing called the Internet, we can consider that there are a couple of ways to break this up. We can do this by straight up network. You know, I'm on this particular IP address and this particular IP address is part of this particular data network. I might organize my communication pathways based on who I talk to or what services I access so that we might think more along the lines of social networks. A more recent term is the idea of slicing a network, but another way is to use namespaces. So in the top part of this image we have this topology that's drawn and the red circles indicate actual IP based networks that you might organize. So this could be IP version 4 or IP version 6, it doesn't really matter. All of the nodes that are connected to a particular switch that connect up to a particular router will be on the same network or subnet. And that's a nice way to think about things. But it's not usually the way that we access services. So for example, my printer my favorite web server, my mail server, these might be located in completely different areas of the country or completely different organizational structures. 
So another way to think about this is, who do I talk to? So the green circle there might indicate that everybody on the left-hand side there communicates together. So we might call that a social network of some kind or a way of organizing our resources. But on the other hand, we might communicate with folks that are completely distinct and separate from my physical connections on one side of the network. So I might talk to folks that are on the other side of a network or on the other side of the state or on the other side of the globe for that matter. And that's sort of indicated by the purple circles here. So the namespace is another way to think about this. Now that breaking up into the namespace doesn't really affect us as individuals, at least from the way that we're used to thinking about things. You connect your machine to your home network or to your work network, and you're not really conscious of the domain most of the time. But the guys that run the network certainly are. The way that we organize the services within your company or within a domain is certainly dependent upon this namespace organization. So the domain name system is divided into what we'll call subdomains. So .edu and .com, these are called our subdomains. And the idea is that if the whole namespace could be organized in this way, we could sort of build a tree. When we start talking about communication, we're very fond of, of building trees and graphs and paths to sort of describe how we are connected. Now your individual name, so I might be brucehartpence.rit.edu, that might be the name of my machine here, that dotted notation is my fully qualified domain name. And that name actually can trace a path all the way back to the root of the tree for the subdomain that I'm part of. So it's actually kind of cool. So in this example here, we might have, we start all the way at the bottom at the VAX there and move all the way up through a particular, probably school, up to the .edu subdomain. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So we have all these subdomains. Okay, big deal. We're trying to replace that host.txt thing, and we're trying to figure out how we can get answers to all of our questions. Okay, so the question, as you recall, is... I need to get to this name, this particular server, human-readable name, and I need the IP address because computers talk IP addresses. The name servers have all of this information. Now, there are lots of different kinds of name servers. Every, well, I won't say every, a lot of companies have their own name server. You build a name server, and in that name server, you provide all of these files that are kind of like those host.txt files. So when a resolver, each computer that has the ability to ha ask the question, says, hey, listen, I'm trying to get out to uh, Microsoft.com. This request goes to a local name server. Now, that local name server might know a lot or it might know a little. Sometimes the name servers have to hand it off to somebody else. Sometimes they can answer the question directly because either they know the answer, it's in their files, or because they've cached the information. Now, all the way at the top of this tree are something called the root servers. They're the guys that are the final word. They know all for a particular subdomain. But another name server that's not necessarily a root might also know an awful lot. And so we call that one an authority for that particular part of the tree or that particular part of the subdomain. So again, the resolvers ask the question of the server. Now servers, once they get a question from a resolver, can do a couple of things. They can try and answer it themselves. So that might be because they have the information stored. Or they might say, hold on a sec, I don't know the answer, but I'll, I know somebody who does. And they try to answer it for themselves. We call that a recursive lookup. Now the resolver uh, might also be told, listen, I don't know the answer but there's a server over there that might know the answer. Why don't you go ask him? So we call that, that's part of the iterative process of DNS. So your resolver asks the question of the name server. And the name server has a couple of ways that it can try to answer the question for you. Now this means that every time you try to access a resource by name, the first thing that you have to do is query the domain name system server. And then 
you can go out to your resource. So this is true whether you're hitting your mail server or whether you're hitting your favorite website. It just doesn't matter. So there's a, an order of operations. It's possible that over the course of the, the morning when you first log in, you've actually made several DNS requests before you actually got any work done. So here's an example. I hope this isn't too small for you guys to read. But on the left-hand side, we've got a query. We've got this question that we asked. Now, this just happens to be my browser. And my browser came up and said, well, I'm going to do some add-ons here. I need to find out how to do these. And I've got this name that I'm trying to resolve. So we've got that add-ons.mozilla.org. So I go out and ask my DNS server, my name server, for an answer to this particular question. And then the name server comes back. And on the right, we can see this with the IP address for that particular destination. That's the answer. So the resolver on the left says, hey, I need an answer for this particular query. And the name server comes back on the right with the answer. And that is an IP address in this particular case. Now, before we go, I wanted to make you aware of yet another fabulous tool that it's nice to have in your toolbox. You're used to ping. You're used to trace route. Now we've got NS Lookup. NSLOOKUP is a way to see answers to your queries. So you can run NSLOOKUP on most systems. You can ask either for IP addresses or for names. There's actually a bunch of things you can do with NSLOOKUP. You can look into it a little bit more. Type in NSLOOKUP. It gives puts me into the, the command prompt for NSLOOKUP. And NSLOOKUP generates these queries for me. So we can see that the first one I asked was www.rit.edu. And the server came back with the IP address of this particular server and the fully qualified uh, name of the web server. On the other hand, I can do the exact opposite called a reverse lookup. I can say, well, what's the name that goes with this particular IP address? I put in 8.8.8.8, .8 and that returns the name that goes along with that IP address. And then just for fun, you can uh, take a look at the root servers out there, too. Well, that'll about do it for this particular video. Remember that this closes out Chapter 10 in the Packet Guide to Core Networking Protocols from O'Reilly. Next up from the networking labs here at RIT will be software-defined networking. I'm Bruce Hartbentz, and I thank you very much for listening. Thanks for watching, and may your packets always reach their destinations.